You're listening to Mr. Liverpool himself, Frank Carlisle, exclusively, exclusively on Mersey Radio. We're going over to that. Hello, Jerry. Oh, Frank. I'm Good having problems you, here with uh, my studio guests. No one's ever heard of the big three, one of them, but the other oh, fella you. has. And uh, I'm going to ask you a question here, Jerry. I'm going to ask you a question because I know that you've got a, an affiliation towards, uh, say, St George's Hall, am I right? Well, you know about it, isn't uh, A little. Yeah, a little, okay. Well, I'm going to ask you, have you ever seen the Minton Tile floor? Because we've just been mentioning about the, uh, you know, the St George's Hall and the, the Minton Tile floor, you know, the cover, is going to be lifted so that people can uh, have a look at it. Have you ever seen it before? No, I haven't actually. It's absolutely wonderful, Derek. I can it's, imagine. It's one of the greatest sights, you know, of floors yeah. that you could possibly see. And there are yeah, some I, magnificent I, floors around the world. But that one, see it before before the big uh, the big pearly gates, if you like. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. You've got to go up and see them sometime. Anyway, um, do you know what, I'm, I'm just reading here, you know, uh, Cass and the Casanovas at the Mardi Gras, and I St. George's Hall, unbelievable, and I, I can't believe that the big three, you know, um, Ian Golder, who is, by the way, you know, he's an authority himself on, um, on music, you know, right. groups and everything else, and he's never heard of them, so can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the Mardi Gras and the Arts Ball and St. George's Hall and Adrian Barber, Johnny Hutchinson, Johnny Gustafsson, they were the big three and Brian Cassar decided to try his look in London. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I mean, the uh, the big three were widely thought locally at the time to be the, uh, the first Liverpool band to uh, sort of crack it nationally. That's right. Um, but for some, well, it, it, it's one of those really strange situations where uh, they they were I, I mean I saw them a few times they they were probably my favourite Liverpool them and the Undertakers were oh. my favourite oh. Liverpool bands at the yeah. time yeah. and I saw them both a few times yeah, yeah. Uh, and they were unbelievable live but they they didn't quite manage to capture it on uh, on records I mean they did have a couple of well they have four singles in all I mean the first two people who've heard of the big three will have heard of it's uh, the first one was some other guy and I managed some to get other them, guy, seven unbelievable. Charts. And by the way, got to 22 on the charts. Yeah. Um, but they never really quite uh, cracked it. But what happened was, it all started with uh, Casey Jones. Yeah. Uh, back in the uh, the late 50s. Uh, he, he was actually born in Newcastle, but he was brought up in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And he's got connections all over the place. I mean, the guy is one of the real unsung heroes of uh, of rock and roll, particularly Merseybeat. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, he he moved on before the commercial success came. Yeah. But he he did some national service and he met Bill Wyman. They were in the RAF together in Germany, really? and they formed a skiffle group. Yeah, he, he was in a skiffle oh. group with Bill Wyman, really? and that's definitely uh, kosher because it's actually in Bill Wyman's uh, blues book, which is wow. well worth. Wow. Um, obviously, Bill Wyman went on to to great things. Well, yeah, so, the on, He opened. In sort of late 58, 50, early 59, he opened the Casanova Club uh, in, in London, in Liverpool, uh, before he formed uh, Cass and the Casanovas, yeah. um, sort of 59. Yeah. Well, what so about, I mean, uh, you know, like, I know the Beatles, I know they supported, uh, uh, they, they supported the Beatles at one stage, the big three, and, uh, you know, they were actually made up that, they were actually one of the support bands. Am I right at saying that, by the way? Oh, very much so. I mean, by the time, time the uh, the big three came to support them at that stage, I mean, the Beatles were um, headed on. Um, I mean, it took them a long time to get going, but um, from the time in uh, October 62 when they released Love Me Do, the first single, mm -hmm. um, they, they very quickly uh, became very, very, uh, very big. Mm -hmm. But... What happened, uh, they uh, did, both did an audition for Larry Parnes and Billy Fury to be the backing band. Oh, right. Uh, and Tommy Moore, the Beatles drummer, was actually late. Right. Uh, so uh, Johnny uh, Hutchinson stood in for him. 
they, you know, they've got connections. Well, they've got a few connections to the Beatles. Mm. It's funny enough, Johnny Hutchinson also stood in for about three gigs um, after Pete left and before Ringo joined. Right. So he stood in a, a couple of times. So he was, a, he was an original big three, yeah, Johnny Hutchinson. Oh, very much so, yeah. I mean, Adrian Barber and Johnny Hutchinson, uh, well, and, and Johnny Gustafson were the original big three, but what happened mm. was that... Um, Cass and the Casanovas went through a few um, uh, lineup changes. In fact, they they split up. The big three started when Cass and the Casanovas split up around oh, right. sort of December 1960. Yeah. And uh, Brian Casser headed off to London to uh, try his luck down there. And he was he was in a few interesting things there. He was the manager of a blue the uh, Blue Gardenia mm. uh, club. But you know, uh, can you give us some uh, idea? Obviously, with you, I think you might know this, Derek. Why do we call the Big Three? Because uh, well, why were they called the Big Three? Uh, I, I've never seen a, a definitive reason, but uh, I would imagine it was because they uh, they came back down from being a quartet again when uh, when he left, and they were very very much a power trio. I think it was probably to um, sort of reinforce that. I mean, that was the thing about when they were live. Um, I mean, they were a very loud band. They were a very yeah. big band. They had a very big sound. Well, I, I thought one of them was a big lad. You know, yeah, it's, it's John O'Hare here. Um, good, good to sit here again, Brian. Uh, but I do believe we've seen an interview with uh, Johnny Gustafson, I think it was, and he, he'd said at the time, um, there was the, obviously all the big the big three politicians, uh, Derek, um, that was it was um, Khrushchev, it was um, Truman, and oh, right. and, uh, and and Churchill, and it was the big three. It was the big meeting of the big three in Tehran, and uh, they thought, oh yeah, well we're the big big three lads, with three of us, the big three makes a, it was a poignant thing in the press at that time. And that was where they got the name from. Right, isn't that unbelievable? Listen, you know where uh, the first time I ever heard some of the guy. Do you know who I heard singing it? I was at um, I, sp- I bunked off school. I always remember this, and we went to, I forget where it was, it was somewhere anyway, so bunked off school, went up, and I was looking at these lads, do you ever remember the Denisons, Derek? Yeah, I do. And they sang Some Other Guy. Some Other Guy, yeah. Some Other Guy, now I was thinking my love away from me, oh now. Do you think I passed the audition there? <laughs> Without a shadow of a doubt. That's <laughs> but anyway, you know, this is uh, fascinating stuff, you know, it's, uh, it really is. And what about this uh, I'm With You, you know, because I've never heard of this I'm With You, that song. No, it's... Uh, it's is it uh, an ambiguous one? You know, is it one that's just... Uh, you know, well, obviously, I've never heard a play before. Is it one that's just forgotten? I think so. It's it's you know it's just sort of um, drifted into the sands of uh, time, really. Mm. I mean, what's interesting that "Don't Ha Ha" was a very big hit for uh, well, Casey Jones, as he called himself, mm. and, and the governors at that stage. Because yeah. uh, what happened was that um, uh, Brian Cassock, as Casey Jones, went off to Germany because everybody played Hamburg a lot. And he was po- very popular over there, and basically he stayed over there. And uh, that was that was um, around 65. That was a very big hit for him in Germany. He, in fact, he, he had a, a string of hits um, over there. What year he, are you talking about now? Well, that, that Don Ha Ha was 1965. Oh, right, um, because, you, you know, he, he, like, he split, didn't he, with Brian Epstein? That's right, that's right. Uh, well, the, the big three itself. I mean, they signed up uh, with Brian Epstein yeah. uh, around the sort of um, 1962 before the big three went to um, to Hamburg. Right. But again, you know, that was, and I've seen it re- re- uh, reported as Brian Epstein's only failure, but that's not quite true. I mean, Tommy Quickly didn't have too much success with him. Uh, but it, it didn't really work out with Brian Epstein either. I think the big three is one of the real sad stories of... Um, of uh, well, certainly Mersey B and British sort of rock and roll in general, really, because the, the look didn't seem to run with them. Mm. Apparently, when they recorded some of the guy, it was actually the recording that they'd done at the uh, the uh, uh, audition for uh, for Decca, and then they insisted, mm. Decca insisted that they put that version out as the single. And I mean, the Big Three weren't happy about that, as you can imagine, because they wanted to uh, re-record it. 
Yeah, yeah. I said, Derek, I've seen other things about about um, this because they do seem to have a terrible luck. I mean, they recorded an album, yeah. and, and I think it was Decca wiped all the tapes, and then they yeah. did a live. They were going to do a live album, which was the big three live and unleashed. I think it was in, in the cavern. Yeah. And yeah. Again, guess what? A lot of them were destroyed and it wasn't recording, yeah. and they were left with four of the tracks on the live, and they released it as an EP instead. Um, yeah. and, and they seem to be cursed. And obviously, the original lineup, um, they all wanted to better things, you know, obviously, um, in one thing or another, but also Johnny Hutchison. I mean, I was going to ask you about him, he seemed to have the best look of a lot of them, really. Uh, but was it true that, you know, when you said he filled in for the Beatles, was there any rumours that he could have stayed on with the Beatles rather than Ringo coming in, or...? Um, I've never seen any uh, any reports that said they are actually offered him the job mm-hmm. uh, because they, they knew Ringo as well very well from um, Hamburg, and they'd actually uh, Ringo had stood in a few times uh, while they were playing in Hamburg, and uh, he actually recorded with the um, uh, with the Beatles in Hamburg as well. Did he? Yeah, yeah. When they were, they Rory Storm was playing out there at the same yeah. time, and the first well, I'll tell you the first Beatles recording session, but certainly in, in Hamburg. Mm. Uh, they did a, a recording session uh, with Ringo. Oh, that, yeah, right. the what, that's, the, that's come as a great surprise. It's a good surprise, mm. actually, because, you know, people, like myself included, mm. uh, we know that uh, that Ringo was a good drummer with Rory, and John Lennon liked uh, Rory Storm and the other kids, you know, because they were all mates. They were all, like, mingling <laughs> together and, you know, encouraging each other. And that has come a, as a great, great surprise to me that he actually was over there in Hamburg and yeah. did a session with them. Yeah, they they, they uh, recorded. Was uh, there any, uh, sorry, was there any animosity between, you know when Ringo actually left Rory Storm to go with the Beatles, was there any animosity between Rory and... You know the rest of the lads, the rest of the other canes uh, against the Beatles because they more or less stolen their uh, top drummer. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. Um, to be honest, that, you know, I've never seen anything that said um, you know there was uh, a big hoo ha or anything. Because a, a lot of uh, a lot of people moved around um, in those days, you know, from uh, from band to to band. And as you say, I mean, they all knew each other very well from the from the Hamburg days and the Cavern days. Um, I don't think there was any uh, animosity associated with the with the move. Always. The same sort of thing happened years later, didn't it? And um, you know, with Eric's, all the, uh, I had Eric, sorry, a team. Um, Hi. You know, with with the Eric scene, the same sort of thing happened. All the all the artists ended up playing in different bands, and then they they just progressed and became known as who they became as in the end. And, you know, yeah, that's strange. That that that's a good the, point. What Ian just have said. You there. Act, have you actually seen the yeah. um, you know the wall thing that you get at pubs in Liverpool? The yeah, tour, yeah. and there's that's one right. of Eric's, yeah. and it it shows like a fa- it's yeah. like a tree, isn't it? A family that's tree right. mm-hmm. of Eric's, and basically you've got all the artists and what yeah. bands they played in, and as it comes down, it's the final. Well, do you know bands. The, uh, Newington Street? Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you've got the beer, the beer house there, and you go into the back and you see like a child's walk. Well. It's not like it's a, it is a child's wall, mm. and you see all the names, or yeah. you know, by the signatures of these lads, everyone, Peter Hooten's there, yeah, yeah. Uh, John Powers there, and you see them all, and they're all there, Nash is there, mm. you know. So it, it, it's great to say, I think what Ian's just said there, it, it struck a chord with me because do you reckon that people, you know, out of bands, do you ever? Any, do you ever remember that, asking you? Remember when Tony Jackson split with from the Searchers? Now Tony yeah. Jackson was the voice, wasn't mm. he, of the Searchers? Yeah. And he formed his own group. Yeah, nothing happened. Mm. Can you tell us more about that, if you can? Yeah, he, he formed his own group, the uh, the Vibrations. Um, but they they were never. He, he never managed to capture anything like the success of the. Uh, that the searches had. Could you tell me? Could you could, could you let the listeners know your opinion on that? Why he didn't? Because as I said, he was the voice before the split of uh, the searches. 
Yeah, I, I, I can't remember exactly when he left, but it was probably um, around 64. Yeah, that was, yeah. I can't exactly. And the thing is that the, the whole beat uh, thing was uh, running its course by then. Um, you know, it was 64 that the British invasion started. You know, the Beatles, Dead Clark Five, and a bunch of bands were really successful, including the Searchers, over in America. And the Americans were even having to invent British-sounding names. Like, before they were the birds, they called themselves the Beef Eaters uh, oh, to try and get a look in. Yeah. Um, but what happened was that uh, beat music really uh, ran its course. And by about 65, then 66, you've got, pe- you've got bands like Cream and Jimi Hendrix falling. Oh, and that yeah. was forming, and that was basically the birth of rock music, mm, yeah. uh, as we know it. And I think what probably happened with Tony Jackson was he was 18 months... Uh, too late in terms of um, making the move. So do you, so the, th- do you reckon that it was just because uh, the Americans wanted the already established names, do you reckon? Um, well, there would have been uh, a lot of that uh, mm. in terms of um, uh, being able to get onto uh, the, the, the tours and the and the rest there. Yeah. But I think one of the other stories about the searches I was like was when Chris Curtis left, he decided he put together a bank. He started. He decided he put together a new band, and he called it Rainbow. And he started recruiting people. And then he moved on before it was um, you know, that it, yeah. finished. And that was Deep Purple. Deep Purple, yeah. Now, so, isn't it? Now, we, you know, for the listeners out there, they, obviously they know about the searches and everything else. But Chris Curtis, Chris Crummy was the drummer, wasn't he? That's right. Yeah. You know, it's just to let the listeners know because people yeah. say, "Well, what was he in the uh, the band?" He, uh, I always remember my dad saying he was on the same road and knew knew the family well. And when they got to number one the first time, he was in the back garden with his drums at midnight, <laughs> banging away at the drums. But the Brilliant. thing is, wasn't he leader of the uh, the group? He itself? wasn't supposed to be. He, no, um, yeah. Tony Jackson's big problem was he was getting told, you know, you wanted to do a little bit less here, Tony. Uh-huh. And he said, "Who are you? You're not the leader of the band." Because yeah. I've been singing them. Could you? The first all number one hits here. Yeah. Why, why he said he was getting slowly and slowly pushed out, and eventually yeah. he went. Yeah. But Chris, I think, started to think he wasn't. He, he had that distinctive drumming style of standing up. That's right. Yeah. Well, we we had Mike Penzer on the show, and we did we we just have ask him why yeah. you know that <laughs> you know that. So we did we did have to ask uh, Derek Shelby, yeah. but Derek, we've come to the end. I'm awfully sorry. I'm awfully well, sorry. The end. It's been absolutely fascinating. People have been. Uh, Sends a messages through saying that's fascinating, especially about Ringo Starr, right? That they knew nothing about, and the big three, by the way, that Ian Golzer knows about now. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, actually, I've just put down I've, while we were talking. Well, you were talking. <laughs> yeah. I was just uh, searching, 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 like that. Yeah. <laughs> searching on Spotify for them, so I'm going to have a little listen later. No, they are uh, they're, they're absolutely <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> Even Lennon liked them. So if anyone. If, if Lennon liked them, you've got to like them yourself. I thought mm. they were fabulous. I'll just leave you with this. You know, I mentioned uh, the Denisons. What yep. did you think of that? I thought they were fabulous myself. Yeah, they were. They were great. And I love um, the Undertakers, as you said. I'm sorry. Go uh, on. Go on. No, I was just going to say. I mean, they, they, there were just so many uh, really good bands uh, around that sort of time. Mm. It was, it was just a, a great time for, uh, for that, that whole 62 uh, to 64, 65 was a brilliant time. That was the that was the Maisy Beat sound, wasn't it? That was the Maisy right. sound. That was and it. That, was, that led the world. I mean, it is, yeah. uh, London had the Stones and the R&B thing, uh, but the, the Mersey Beat sound was... It, that, that, that was... That was a great one of the great the part of the great driving force of the British invasion that went across to mm-hmm. America. Well, it changed the whole concept, didn't it? Really, of uh, yeah. of music because everyone, you know, Elvis and everybody else, Chuck Berry and Fats Domino, and you yeah. know, great, great as they were. Don't get me wrong, but they changed the whole of the the pattern of music. Mm-hmm. That's the only way I can put it. Well, it's it's thanks to the, the likes of. Um, uh, the Beatles and um, Cass and the Casanovas and all the others covering the American R&B that Chuck Berry had a career after uh, about 1960 mm-hmm. because from uh, fr- from the point of view of the sort of 1950s American rock and roll R&B scene um, it, it was fading away into a very clean cut 
uh, pop idol version of uh, rock and roll. Yeah. Sort of surf music was was coming along, and it was when the Beatles and the like uh, took it back to America in uh, '64. Uh, that it really um, revitalised the careers of people like Muddy Waters and yeah, uh, yeah. Chuck Berry and, and that whole genre of, uh, yeah. of you know classic blues and R&B artists. Because most of their success in the 50s, I mean, Chuck Berry had very little commercial um, success. Uh, mm. It's sad to think that my ding ling was the only number one he ever that had. That was mad, yeah. though, and I, I, I never liked that. Jennifer, <laughs> honestly, I'm sorry, we, we have sorry, to mate. leave. Um, it, the next time that you're on, will you come back on? Oh, I'd love to. Love to. I love to. Do you fancy you talking about the clubs, especially the Iron Door? Because I, I, you know, everybody talks about the cavern. Obviously, we'll bring the cavern into it. But mm. you know, is there any way that you can talk about the Iron Door? That's where yeah, I used to go. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, brilliant! Now, don't <laughs> forget, you know, we'll have you on next month, hopefully. Uh, oh, well, Jason will sort it out so as long as you're available. That is, um, no, we'll, we'll talk about the Iron Door. How about that? That'd be fabulous. Oh, thank you. So, and the cavern. We, we can't forget oh, the cavern. Can't forget obviously, the cavern. obviously, you know. Uh, honestly, Derek. Once again, I, I've got to thank you very much, and the lads would like to thank you as well. Yeah, thanks for that, um, Derek. Interesting oh, stuff, it's my pleasure, mate. Guys. Yeah, really, really interesting. I love you. We'd love you coming on. Actually, to be honest with you, because it's, uh, it's it just brings back the greatness of where all this music's come from. Mm. You know? Yeah, it does. <laughs> once again, Derek. Thank you so much, and we'll speak to you next month. Thanks a lot, guys. Look forward to it. Bye, Derek. Bye, Derek. Thank you. The best in 60s and 70s music, plus a little bit of history. Tune in to Frank Carlisle every Monday at 8pm here only on Mersey Radio.